Hi YouTube, it's Joshua Miles and welcome back to my channel. Today's video is another soft true crime case for my Curious Case series. Thank you all so much for your support on my last Wednesday video where I turned myself into Eleanor Neal. I know it was absolutely crazy and I was in the midst of a breakdown, but don't worry, I'm fine now, we're all good, but i um, probably gonna have a breakdown again in the future and turn into another one of your favorite YouTubers, so keep an eye peeled for that. I apologize if you hear um, any hail or weather noises through this video. There's currently a hailstorm going on and um, it's being really inconvenient. I just like to point out this video is not being made to cause disrespect or anything like that. It's just being made to spread awareness about this case by compiling information from various different public sources on the internet. Now with all that being said, Let's delve right into this case. Suzanne Jane Caper was a 16 year old girl born in Greater Manchester, England. She was described by all those who knew her as being gentle, yet unfortunately easily influenced. All Suzanne wanted in life was to be loved. Now Suzanne lived with her mother Elizabeth and her stepfather John. Suzanne, as far as I'm aware, didn't know her biological father. Despite Suzanne having several issues, she was still known as being a very high-spirited and well-mannered girl. She would regularly help her stepfather out around the house doing chores, and she was always polite. Sometime in 1990, when Suzanne was just 14 years old, Suzanne's mother and stepfather separated. So Suzanne and her elder sister, Michelle, decided to move in with their stepfather, John. And it was around this time and over the next two years that Suzanne would slowly stop attending school. Her attendance over the next two years being described as very erratic. However, Suzanne didn't stay with her stepfather for long and she ended up living for short periods of time with other family members and friends. Suzanne eventually began to hang out at the house of 26 year old Jean Powell, who was a mother of three children. Suzanne had actually babysat for Jean when she was 10 years old. So they had been friends for a number of years. Suzanne began to spend almost all her time at Jean Powell's house and essentially began to live with them. Jean Powell lived at 97 Langworthy Road, Moston, in a small Victorian terraced house. Jean was a drug dealer and was often involved in the selling of stolen cars. Michelle Caper, who was Suzanne's older sister, also lived with Jean Powell for a short while, but she moved out in August of 1992. Michelle moved out because she didn't like the evil new friends that Jean Powell had started hanging out with. In particular, Michelle didn't like Jean's new friend, Bernadette McNeely, who had moved in just three doors down. Eventually, Bernadette also moved into Jean's house despite having a house just three doors away. And Bernadette moved in with her three children, meaning that there were now six children in the house. Suzanne continued to regularly stay at Jean Powell's house. And this was despite the fact that Jean and Bernadette actually bullied her. According to Michelle, Suzanne wasn't scared of them. She would just do absolutely anything for them. She pampered their every every whim, according to Michelle. Jean Powell had actually separated from her husband, Glyn Powell. However, the two of them remained friends and Glyn regularly visited the house as he lived not so far away. Bernadette's boyfriend was 16 year old Anthony Dudson. And Anthony was not only having sex with Bernadette, but also with Jean Powell. Jean was also sexually involved with another man called Jeffrey Lee. Jeffrey was a regular visitor visitor and a regular customer of Jean's, with his products of choice being amphetamines. Jean's younger brother, Clifford Pook, was also a frequent visitor of the house. In late 1992, two years after Suzanne's mother and stepfather got divorced or separated, Suzanne went to her mother's house after she had been badly beaten up by Jean and Bernadette. However, her mother cruelly turned Suzanne away, even when Suzanne begged to stay just the night. Suzanne's mother said that Suzanne's mother's boyfriend wouldn't let Suzanne stay in the house. So Suzanne went back to Jean Powell's house. This would be a mistake that Suzanne's mother would live with for the rest of her life. Before Suzanne ever became involved with a group of misfits living at Jean's house, she had no human companionship other than that of her own family. And it was at Jean's house that she found this source of human contact. And Suzanne found it very, very difficult to break up that friendship, despite the fact that it was very abusive. Now, in December of 1992, the group claimed that Suzanne had stolen a pink duffel coat. The group also claims that Suzanne had infected them all with pubic lice. Now, at this point in time, Anthony, who was now 17 years old, was having sex with Jean, 
Bernadette and Suzanne. And according to Anthony, he had contracted pubic lice from Suzanne. Now, this pink duffel coat going missing and getting pubic lice may sound like a very trivial and kind of unimportant thing. And not really a big deal, but the group thought very differently. On the 7th of December, 1992, the group lured Suzanne out of her stepfather's home where she had gone after being badly bullied about the pubic lice. The gang lured her back to their home under the pretense that a guy who Suzanne liked and fancied was there waiting for her and wanted to talk to her about something. When Suzanne got to the house, Glyn and Anthony were waiting. They held her down while Glynn shaved her hair, her eyebrows, and her pubic area. Afterwards, Glynn put a plastic bag on Suzanne's head and made her walk around while they hit her on the head. The gang then took it in turns to hit her with a belt buckle and a large ornamental wooden spoon. They did this all while laughing and shout. This beating was actually so severe that one of Susan's arms would hang useless by her side for the rest of her imprisonment. After the brutal beating had ended, the gang locked Suzanne in the cupboard. Now because Jean and Bernadette's children all lived in a house where Suzanne was now locked and kept hostage in a cupboard, the gang decided to move Suzanne to Bernadette's abandoned home out of fear that Suzanne's screaming would disturb the children. She was moved on the 8th of December 1992 and when she got to the house, they tied up Suzanne with cables, spread her legs, and tied her to a upturned bed. When Clifford and Jeffrey came to the house, they saw Suzanne tied up to the bed, blindfolded and gagged. The next five days for Suzanne were pure torture. Her two front teeth had been pulled out with pliers by Clifford, who apparently laughed while doing so. Another tooth was snapped in half, which actually exposed a nerve. Suzanne, during this five-day period, was also injected with amphetamines, and she had sustained burns to her face and body because the gang would extinguish their cigarettes on her. Suzanne had been kept in the same place for a number of days, and she had sat in her own urine and excrements. Due to the bad smells, the gang decided to wash her, so what they did is they picked her up and put her in a bathtub full of concentrated disinfectant. And in that bath, they scrubbed her clean using a very hard bristle brush until her skin began to peel off. Throughout all this torture and abuse, Suzanne was subjected to listening to Chucky's voice repeating, I'm Chucky, wanna play through headphones. Hi, I'm Chucky. Wanna play? They also blasted rave music at full volume through headphones. And because she was tied up, she couldn't do anything to get the headphones off of her head. Between the 10th of December and the 14th of December, I couldn't pinpoint an exact date, a 18 year old boy called David Hill came to the house. And he came to the house because the gang had asked him to house sit. When David got to the house and before David was left alone in the house, Jeffrey took David to Suzanne. David saw Suzanne with a cloth covering most of her face. No hair and dried blood around her mouth. Once the gang left David with Suzanne, Suzanne began to beg for help. She asked David to untie her, but David said that he couldn't do anything. David claims that he was too scared of the gang. He thought that they would batter him or do the same thing that they've done to Suzanne if he snitched or tried to help her get away. Now, while David was house-sitting, Anthony and Jeffrey had taken a car to go get fixed. David claims that he thought the gang was actually nearby and hadn't gone far. And he said that if he knew that they had all gone on these excursions quite far away from the house, then he would have knocked down the door and let Suzanne out and let her go. But despite him saying this, he didn't do that. David went on to claim that that he didn't think the gang could be capable of such savagery, especially with what happens next. In the early hours of the 14th of December, 1992, Suzanne was put in the back of a Fiat Panda car. Now this car was a car that the gang had stolen and had repaired. They then drove Suzanne to a remote woodland near Stockport, where she was forced out of the car and pushed down an embankment. As she fell down the embankment, Suzanne rolled through stinging nettles and brambles and cut her bare feet on thorns. Bernadette then poured petrol all over the horrified teenager before the gang set her alight. Suzanne screamed as she went up in flames. The gang began to sing, burn baby burn, 
as they laughed at Suzanne on fire before leaving the scene, presuming Suzanne to have died. But miraculously, Suzanne somehow managed to survive the brutal attack. Suzanne climbed up the embankment onto the main road, where she was found by Sari Sutcliffe, who was driving on his way to work. When Suzanne was found, Suzanne was very, very, very polite and was thanking Barry to no ends before telling him, over there in that field, they poured petrol on me and set me alight. But Barry didn't need to be told what happened to Suzanne because it was clear from the skin hanging from her battered body what had happened to her. Suzanne had suffered severe burns to over 80% of her body. Barry rushed Suzanne to a nearby house where they phoned for an ambulance. Suzanne was quickly taken to a hospital where she soon fell into a coma. Four days later, on the 18th of December, 1992, at Withington Hospital, Suzanne Jane Caper passed away. However, before Suzanne fell into the coma, Suzanne was sure to tell everyone that she met and came across who had done this to her. She named every single one of her killers, giving addresses and every single detail that she could. When the police arrived at 97 Langworthy Road, they were met by a complete and utter mess. The living room was full of rubbish and litter, and there were stolen car seats lining the walls, making makeshift sofas. In the home, they found Suzanne's hair in the bin, some of her teeth that had been extracted, and a pair of bloody pliers. The entire gang was immediately arrested and they all initially denied having any involvement in the crimes. That was until Anthony caved under his father's persuasion. On the 23rd of December 1992, the day before Christmas Eve, the entire gang was charged with murder. And then on the 8th of January 1993, an inquest into the murder of Suzanne Jane Caper was opened. The trial of Suzanne Caper lasted 22 days and started on the 16th of November 1993. The jury took just 10 hours to decide on the verdicts. During the trial, the gang turned on one another to try to push the blame off themselves and onto other people. All of them distanced themselves from the final brutal attack on Suzanne where they set her on fire. According to Jean, she sat in the car while the others set Suzanne on fire. Jean also claimed that she had put Suzanne in the cupboard for her own protection and that she loved her like she was her sister. Bernadette claimed that yes, she had carried the petrol canister, but said that Anthony grabbed it from her moments before they set Suzanne on fire. Bernadette also claimed that she had injected Suzanne with amphetamines to protect her from heroin injections that were also being put into her. Anthony then told the court that Glynn had actually been the one to set Suzanne on fire. Jean Powell, Bernadette McNeely, and Glyn Powell were all sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 25 years. Jeffrey Lee was sentenced to only 12 years. Anthony Dudson was detained indefinitely with a minimum term of 18 years. Clifford Hayes was sentenced to just 15 years. In 2012, Jean Powell's sentence was actually reduced by two years, and this was because she had allegedly shown remorse inside prison and had actually helped stop a prison escape attempt. Bernadette McNeely, Jeffrey Lee, and Clifford Hayes all walk free today. And in my opinion, all of them for this horrific, horrific crime should have all been sentenced to life in prison without parole at all. I can't believe that they've been let out and are walking amongst us. That is so, so, so crazy to me. And I think the justice system has failed Suzanne and her family in this case. A lot of people who are aware of this case say that this is why the death sentence should be brought back. And I'm not gonna give my opinions on the death sentence, but I just thought I should let you know that a lot of people feel very strongly that the justice system has failed Suzanne in this case. And I completely agree that the justice system has failed them. They should all have gotten life in prison. Let me know what you think of this case in the comment section down below. I apologize that this video is late. I had some technical difficulties with recording this video. Thank you all so much for watching this episode in my Curious Case True Crime series. If you wanna watch any more of these videos, I'll leave a link Link to my Curious Case playlist in the iCards here. There is also a link to that in the description below. If you're new here, I upload two videos a week, one on Wednesdays, which is a really random, usually funny, lighthearted video, um, and then one on Sundays, which is this regular true crime case video. So be sure to subscribe and hit that bell icon so you can be notified every single time that I post. Don't forget to like this video if you found it interesting. And uh, now with all that being said, I'll see you in the next video.